This is the Van Scroll Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. For the last few Fridays, I've been releasing bonus episodes describing how you can become a tangibly better communicator. However, this week I had some friends stop by and the conversation we were having out on the patio was so compelling that I decided, hey, you know, we got to stop this. Let's, I know I'm breaking up the party, but let's go into the studio, flip on the microphones and have a conversation. And surprisingly enough, they agreed. The two people that I'm going to be interviewing are big names in the agriculture world. One is a corn and soybean farmer named Rob Sharkey, otherwise known as the host of the Shark Farmer podcast. And the other person is a Canadian grain farmer from Saskatchewan named Meg Reynolds. We will go through their background, who they are and what they do, but I was so honored that they were willing to stop by and do this interview, and I'm really excited to share it with you. You'll notice the camera angles, if you're watching this on YouTube, are a little bit different than they normally are, but we had a few more, we had another voice on here, and so we had to share microphones, we had to do some things, but I think the workaround actually proved to be a really great interview. So buckle in and enjoy. Meg Reynolds, Rob Sharkey, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's fun to have an impromptu podcast every once in a while. Yeah, you know, um, I've had about uh, 19 episodes, and I would say 15 of them have all stemmed from I was drinking on the patio with my friends and then (laughs) said, you guys should come back and do a podcast. But you two are in town only for a short time, Mm -hmm. so I thought, I better not waste this chance, even though you've been drinking... I'm interested in getting your perspective down on uh, video. So welcome to the podcast, and let me start with you. Meg Reynolds, you are a farmer from Canada. Yes, Saskatchewan, Canada. So right and, above Montana. And what does a farmer from from Saskatchewan uh, farm? <laughs> well, this year we've got in flax, lentils, barley, and durum wheat, which is used for growing pasta. And uh, you've been a farmer your whole life. You grew up in the farming world. No, I grew up in a big city. I worked in the film industry for 10 years in Canada, and then I met a farmer and moved out to a grain farm. Now, when you say worked in the film industry, you were you were that, that, that actually has kind of like a connotation. You, what were you doing in the film industry? I was doing set deck and special effects, so everything behind camera to get ready for shooting the film, and special effects was all the hands-on, so smoke, fire, explosions, all the fun stuff. And to be totally candid, when we were setting up the cameras, it was you that we turned to to be like, hey, I'm, how do we yeah. do this? I might have taken over a little bit. <laughs> it was great. I was great. And uh, and uh, Rob Sharkey, yes. you are Hi, a Vance. farmer from central Illinois. And yep. while I have been on your podcast several times, this mm-hmm. is the inaugural appearance for you. I'm so excited to be here. And so why don't you tell the listeners... What kind of farmer are you, and what, what's your backstory? So, my name is Rob Sharkey. I go by the shark farmer in the digital circles. I raise corn and soybeans, so a stereotypical farm kid, grew up on the farm, and then, uh, you know, eventually transitioned back to working with my dad. I tried my hand at hog farming, went to the verge of bankruptcy within the first six months of that, uh, spent the next years of my life digging myself out of that hole. Uh, three years ago, I started a podcast, and which you were on prominently one of the one of the episodes. Uh, it kind of took off, and then we got an offer to do an XM show, and so we've kind of been building off that brand. And uh, for people that did not follow my career during Monsanto before I had a podcast, mm-hmm. but have been listening to the podcast now, they probably wouldn't know you actually made a huge difference in my life. So I was working for Monsanto, and I was making the case to them that podcasts were a deeply important thing and that if you if you felt like the public didn't understand you one of the most important things that you could do would be to get out to podcasts where even if the audience was not millions of people there was a whole lot of value in getting to talk with people that were getting ideas out to a tightly knit group of people that we called tribes Mm -hmm. and yours was one of the very first podcasts I ever did and I don't know that I've ever told you how nervous the company was that I was doing that. They were on the extreme. This was Monsanto. Yes. Back when I was working at Monsanto. Oh, come on. Bunch of Nancy's. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, uh, you did end up asking me if I was working at, uh, what was it? The death star, I think was, the... I believe it. I believe it was a death. Star. I mean, I, I meant it nicely, but yeah, 
I, it is. It's a different medium. It was a new medium. And I think even now, uh, ag companies, ag medias don't know what to do with it because it's it, ag media has been the same way since since I can remember. It's kind of, you know, it's markets, it's uh, weather, it's a little bit of farming news. Uh, and what you do podcast, you can you blow the doors off of what you can talk about. And it made a lot of companies nervous. So I'm glad we shook Monsanto up. Are we the reason that they got sold? I would, yeah, probably put it singularly. No, I, I, okay. I, I do think though that that is the, there is a symbol there about the companies that were adapting and who will be ready for the future and who is who are the companies out there now? Like, are they going to be? Are you seeing with Bear? Are they taking chances out there with uh, getting on podcasts? Uh, man, boy, I did not put you on the spot like this on my podcast, but yes, because you're talking about potential advertisers, but. I'm going to say in general, agriculture is not ready to embrace podcast. And I know damn well that agriculture advertising agencies don't even know what they are. That's so, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, Megs, I think it's pretty important that we give a little bit of your backstory because you were sitting out on my porch and I thought I knew very much at all about you. And then we started talking about trains and all of a sudden you had mm. an opinion on Canadian grain <laughs> lines and all of a sudden you had opinions on China. So why don't you talk a little bit about, you're not just an ordinary farmer. You are out there talking about agriculture. How did you get into this world? How is it that, that you have, is it 22,000 followers on Twitter? So this actually, you don't know this yet, and it links in quite nicely to the story that Rob just shared and you shared, but I was at a conference in Saskatchewan and you were presenting about how important it is that we need to share our farm stories. Oh, yeah. No shit. Dreamy, isn't it? Dreamy up there <laughs> and I, because I have that unique background of, of coming from the city, came to the farm with a lot of preconceived notions that were not correct, but it's that clickbait stuff. You see your friends, your family sharing on social media. And so, you know, over the course of the conference, there was you, there was a couple other presentators that were talking about how it's so important that agriculture is part of that conversation and that we share what we're doing in our story. And I basically got on social media and started creating accounts to do that and to do it in a way that I would have understood before I came to the farm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. And so what conference was that? Women and Egg. It was in Saskatoon. I definitely remember that. It was cold as <laughs> yes, all that hell is our out winters. there. Oh my God. It was so... Um, <laughs> The big challenge of here is we could spend a lot of time talking about social media mm -hmm. and the the revolutionary change that's happened. I think you were definitely a part of it. You you have a big role in it. But we were talking about some pretty interesting mm -hmm. issues regarding the difference between Canadian agriculture and U.S. agriculture. What's going on with farmers vis-a-vis uh, -vis China? Mm -hmm. And I think like. I don't really need to run this conversation. You guys are experts. Let's just go back to the conversation we were having just 50 yeah. feet away out on the patio about China. You know, what's going on in the world. China <laughs> yeah. in, in particular. <laughs> that so, big elephant in the room. So the big thing that I was just watching was I am now seeing on YouTube and in podcasts that there is U.S. led. You could even call it propaganda. There is definitely a drumbeat saying China is not as strong as everybody thinks that they are. They are actually weaker and um but if you tell that to the american farmer who right now is watching the prices yeah. uh, go or the, canadian the canadian as well. farmer, yeah so what's going on with the farming mentality how do they feel about what's going on with the china war what's their perception well the way that it's affected us is that with extradite extradition treaties we had to detain the huawei uh, cto and that basically triggered retaliation from china and so what they did was shut down our canola market, import market into China, and 40% of our canola products go to China. So for us, it's our largest shareholder of that market. Really important. We need that, that market there, especially for that crop. And so that's how it's kind of affected us. Those prices have gone down. It's now gotten into our, our beef and our pork. And um, yeah, we're, we're looking at really low prices across the board. And canola is traditionally a crop that you use to kind of make the money that you can justify still having wheat or other things in your rotation that maybe aren't bringing in as much money as that canola would. What did the Canadian people think about the extradition of the Huawei? It was it was to the U.S.? I mean, like, this no, 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 barely we're still hit my... Her. Okay, yeah, so, we're still so what her. is the situation there? Because I actually don't... 
I didn't know it. It's for the U.S. We were basically asked to detain her um, by your president, <laughs> and <laughs> we're still detaining her. And, and you're required to by treaty, right? Yes. If the U.S. asks for, yeah. for hey, we think that there is a reason for you to extradite this person, mm-hmm. um, you got to hold them. There are many, many things held in the balance if Canada says, no, we're just not going to do yes, it. Yes, there's a reason these treaties are in place and, and a reason that we respect them. And actually, their first retaliation before they came after Egg was to arrest two Canadian prominent citizens in China. So there was direct retaliation on that side. Did you know this was a possibility? Like when you guys were first watching what's going on with Huawei, were you the Canadian farmers sitting there being like, "Uh oh, uh oh, this is coming? I think a lot of people drop the ball, including government that's currently in power. Um, China retaliates through trade. That's what they've done over and over again across many decades. It should not have been a surprise. We should have had someone over there, in my opinion, the next day ready to to kind of preempt this. And instead, we waited for an issue to show up. And we got to the point where we were trying to send over government officials because they said it was a science issue. It's not. Um, so they're trying to send over government officials and we can't even get a meeting. So Wait, so when you say that, they didn't actually overtly say you're not extraditing the Huawei uh, chief. So we're blocking canola. They said your canola isn't pure enough. We they found pests in the canola. Oh, yes. But no proof <laughs> of said pests. But just wow. basically the market shut down at that point. Yeah. And so what has been happening to canola? Does it reroute to other places? Is there demand somewhere else that can soak that up? Not 40% of our market, no. I've heard there's a little bit of canola getting into China through Japan. I couldn't say whether that's true or not, but that's it's. we've definitely seen a negative impact in our canola futures because of it. So we'll come back to this, but Rob, I know you were just on Fox Business News talking about the American farmer and uh, how do they feel about Trump and the China trade war? What, what did you say? What did Fox Business News want to know? And what did you say? Uh, you know, they were really good. They didn't want to put words in my mouth. They, he kind of kept asking the question. And I guess if you've done this long enough, you know, they're kind of hinting towards something. So I said, well, you know, what do you really want? What do farmers think about Trump now that this has gone on for this long? That's kind of what they wanted to know. And what did you say? <laughs> Well, and I, you know, I can only speak for what I've heard and I feel I'm hearing more and more farmers say, you know, this is enough of he needs to be doing something different or we need to have somebody else in there that can handle this situation. That's what I've heard. Just like I said to you, if you look at the American farmer right now, is there any Democratic candidate that could run against Trump that they would walk into the voting booth and vote for instead? Um, Come on, man. (laughs) What? My opinion, uh, uh, so uh, of the ones that are at the top, I don't think so. Biden, I, it would be my guess, no. Yeah. And so why is it, and, and I'd be interested, Meg, you had a good thought on this about uh, why is it, if the, if the American farmer is less than 2% of the population, The people that work in agriculture, probably less than four and a half percent, you know, if you include Mm -hmm. the people doing fuel and driving trucks and all those things. Why is it that the American farmer stands so prominent in the U.S. elections or in in what Fox News wants Mm -hmm. to know? The way I see it as as an outsider looking in is that the American farmer is is that amazing symbol that you had mentioned. Right. And it's. You know, I wish that agriculture in Canada was supported the way that it seems from the outside looking in to be supported in the States. Where Oh, you aren't? No. There isn't like the Canadian farmer, let's run a Dodge commercial to... to... No, not really. It's more like, <laughs> we're not happy with what you're doing. <laughs> Please change it. So I feel like it. it's just, it's that symbol, right? It's kind of that symbol of our our country was built on this, this work ethic and, and farming exemplifies that. And so I think it's a, a way to, yeah, to hold that image and it maybe, yeah. What is the image of the Canadian farmer then? How, how would you I say? I think most if you, people don't think about them. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's not that they have an image, it's that they don't think of them no. at all. Or it's a, that's almost a, more brutal. a negative, you know, why are you doing this? What? Are, why are you using herbicide? Why are you using GMOs? Why are, like, it, it seems right now it's a more of a, a negative why do you want subsidies? Why do you want? Why are we supporting you? So do they do the grain companies or the seed companies come to Canadians and say, 
you too need to be out there speaking because people are going to listen to the Canadian farmer because that's what's going on in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Is that also well, you going did? On? Yeah, that's, I, I know it because I did. It. Yeah, for sure, it's a big conversation, but I think you guys will both know that it's it's easy or kind of easy to get into that conversation and say, yeah, I'm going to get online, I'm going to track people down, have conversations, share my story, but it's really hard to get out of the bubble. So often we're just sharing our stories to other people that are in agriculture, work somehow in agriculture, their grandpa used to farm, they want to hear those stories, so you're not really... I don't feel like we're always getting to the person that we should be having that conversation with. So if you were, um, and Rob, you uh, this goes out to either one of you. Let's imagine you're just a regular mom in the Midwest of the United States or in in one of the provinces in Canada. I don't know. I was going to name <laughs> one, one off the top of my head. Um, and, and you want to know what a farmer thinks about things. How would they even find somebody? Like, the, the, it's funny because, you know, like I definitely was out there like saying, you got to get out there and you talk. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I never really thought about is how does somebody ever find you? I, yeah, I think a lot of people go, Facebook is huge, right? To go online and, and try to find stuff. But I feel more often than not, they're not looking for that person to have that conversation with. They're going to see what they're, and that, that was me. I can say this because I was that person. They're friends and family, or maybe it's that um, movie star they look up to, people with shared values, trust that they're sharing, and that has a larger impact. And uh, how did you end up building such a following? What are you sharing that makes people want to follow you? I actually got into policy and starting lobbying for um, small business, lobbying for agriculture in Canada. What were the things that, I mean, there are lots <laughs> of people out there lobbying, you know, politicians and they mm -hmm. don't have 22,000 followers. I was making videos and I think I was just explaining things in a way that people outside of the industry can understand. This is this policy they're trying to change. This is how it's going to affect us. This is how it's going to affect small business owners. Um, I, I think that kind of hit home for people. And you were pretty honest? Yes. How yeah. so? Yeah, you have like a smirk on your face. Um, fairly blunt. And because I'm not representing anybody, I'm not lobbying for the Canola Council. I'm not lobbying on behalf of whoever. I have the freedom to say something that an organization may not feel comfortable to say. So this spring, I testified before the Federal Standing Committee of Agriculture about the impacts of what was going on with China on farmers in Western Canada. And <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I had the freedom to say a lot of things and to say, you know, this this is this has nothing to do with science. This is trade retaliation, all these things that maybe commodity groups that were there testifying didn't feel comfortable saying exactly the way that I said them. How did it go over? Uh, not very well with the current government. <laughs> so tell me more about that. What do you mean? Uh, I pissed off a fair amount of uh, the liberal MPs that were there, um, but I was also running for the Conservative Party at the time, so that also didn't help. The you ran for political office? Yes. How did that go? What, what, what office? Um, so our riding, it would be federal. So the minister of parliament for the like Canadian. Is it the equivalent of like a state governor? No, U.S. congressman. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for translating. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And so, uh, Rob, when I, uh, the an interesting thing, and this is going to take a little bit of background, is that when you and I first met, mm -hmm. there was very, very little ag alt media right or i don't even know what you would call what what you do but but as far as there were the instantiated successful farming magazine mm -hmm. and and these various groups and they were doing a fine job what was it that made it so why did people want to listen to a guy making a podcast in the middle of central illinois it is social media it showcased people that were good at what they did so you you ever seen the movie ratatouille uh, I'm familiar okay. with it, but no. you, I guarantee you've seen the movie Ratatouille. All right. So it's about this, this, uh, chef that died, uh, and, but he had his always big quote that everybody can cook. And the, the bad guy in the film, the critic, he hated that because he's like, that's stupid. You're just pandering, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the movie, when the critics, you know, coming to his moment of clarity and everything, he says, I know what he meant. He says, not everybody can be an artist, but an artist can come from anywhere. So you can now look at what social media has done and it has opened up the entire world. So the people that can showcase themselves well, like Megs, is going to get attention. I mean, before social media, you would have never heard of Megs. You just want it. 
unless you maybe got in good with someone in the newspaper, you maybe got in good someone with the radio. That was the only way you could do it. And now social media has changed the game. What does this do to the organizations that were originally designed to be the the voice of the farmer, whether it's the Corn Growers Association or the various checkoff programs? Like people in the city have no idea what a checkoff program is. Yeah. Maybe so give an example of what a checkoff program is. So, uh, and there's a lot of reasons. There's a hundred different reasons they started in a hundred different organizations. But say like when I sell a bushel of corn, a fraction of a cent goes to this organization. And then that organization is supposed to, uh, you know, go out and promote corn by advertising, by research, by pumping money into companies they think are eventually going to make a better market for that corn. So that's what the checkoffs are. So there's controversy whether you like them or not. They are taking money out of our paychecks, but uh, in theory, we're supposed to be seeing a return. And, and lobbying on your behalf, correct? And lobbying on our behalf, correct, yeah. Do you have the, the checkoff program in, in Canada? Yes, exactly how Rob just described it. Same thing, it goes to research. Most of the research for our breeding programs is uh, public, so it comes from checkoff, and then it comes some from tax dollars as well. I think one of the things, if anybody's sitting out there not realizing what a checkoff is, as soon as I say this next <laughs> phrase, all of a sudden they're going to got milk, right? Like that yes. is a dairy checkoff money went to a an advertising firm that said, this will be a great program ends up being one of the most mm -hmm. you know high re you you even know the got milk pro i sure do even in canada and so um traditionally they have been the voice of the american farmer is that still true today canadian farmer is the checkoff program the what's yours called the checkoff program yeah we just call it checkoff okay yeah i would say they're extremely important and possibly still the most important I don't know if I'd say the most important, but now it's more like we have all of these things working together to be more effective. So I wouldn't say they're less effective or less important than they were when they first started. But now because of social media, myself as a farmer in Saskatchewan can be very influential with helping the lobbying effort as well. And it's all of those efforts and those organizations coming together where you have multiple voices, you have that echo chamber increase. That's when you actually start to make changes with government. And uh, where was I going? What was I going to say? Um, do you? So we also have provincial groups for policy, like a grassroots provincial egg thing. Do you guys have state run ones? Uh, yeah, and yes, we do. A state and federal. Uh, you know, the biggest one would be the Farm Bureau, right? So that is the the group. And when you were asking the question about you know where do people find information, I think. I would say before social media really took off, I would say that's where people. Even when you had Google but before social media, if you Googled farm, you know, how do I learn about farms? You'd probably get something about Farm Bureau. Yeah. Or today, I don't I don't know. I, I, I haven't Googled anything about farms lately. And but right now you have moved from being a guy that started a podcast up to you have your own satellite radio show mm -hmm. and you're all over the place. What, what's going on? Who's watching you? Is it is it all farmers? I have different audiences. So the my podcast, the Shark Farmer Podcast, is business to business. I'm talking to farmers. Farmers are listening. That's that's what it is. I do another uh, podcast called What the Farm Podcast with another Saskatchewan gal, Leslie Meg, Ray Kelly. Yeah. Meg's isn't my wife, by the way. For people that are wondering, my wife is blonde, but this isn't. Oh, <laughs> that, I didn't even cross my yeah. mind to mention that because it's. Yeah. <laughs> well, I it's remember. A very long yes. distance relationship. Yeah. yeah. Was, well, that I mean, it's been. People have asked about Leslie too. Is Leslie your oh, yeah. wife? No, no. She's uh, she and that podcast is uh, more on the consumer side. We try to get farmers to think about consumer issues and we get consumers to think about farm issues so speaking of that podcast it's funny you mentioned that i remember i was in i don't know maybe new orleans or something i was somewhere mm -hmm. and i was listening to that podcast where you described to leslie ray about how for so long people had been telling farmers go tell your story go tell your story so you get invited to a whiskey tasting in chicago yeah. and you walk right up to a group of people that are doing a whiskey tasting that's supposed to be meet the farm yeah meet the farmer mm -hmm. and you just start telling them your story how'd that go uh okay i mean they were nice they listened whatever but 
uh, in that, I think what happened was then we approached the tables and we asked what they did first. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were asked I mean, anything from whatever, you know, I'm in sales, I'm in whatever. And then once they knew that I was interested in them, mm-hmm. they would ask, and sometimes it would take 10, 15 minutes. They would ask, you know, what do you do? Well, I'm the farmer that grew the corn that you're drinking. Then they wanted to know all about it. So the tables that we approached where I said, hey, I'm the farmer, you know, tell me I'm awesome, was a lot different than the experiences. Then we went up to the table and we said, hey, what do you do? And then the conversation would turn. And both of you are aware of, so in the ag industry, if you're in, in a city right now, you probably don't realize there are a whole bunch of movements out there that are think a farmer, you know, let's have think a farmer day, say, say grateful things for farmer. And there's a bunch of farmer pushback on this right now. What do you think of that? There are farmers saying, don't thank me. I'm no different than the, uh, mm. than the, yeah, Meg, what do you think yeah about I that? thought Rob got all the hard <laughs> questions. I think everyone this is, has so their for, wait, own but, but personal But for people opinion. that are in the city, this is a controversial question. <laughs> and so you I'm not asking her something that's easy. Yeah. <laughs> I would say for me personally, I don't need someone to say thank you. I want someone to be interested in having a conversation and understanding what I do and why I do it and allowing through that conversation that person to be able to go to the grocery store and not be scared to buy food. I would rather have that than a campaign to say I want someone to tell me that they're thankful because we're all out there doing important jobs. But it's more to me, I would have way more validation to have an actual conversation, a genuine connection where we can talk about food and there's trust there, there's respect there and to have positive gains where people aren't scared to go shopping. So I don't know if you've taken a public position on this, but I get super frustrated, (laughs) but I'm guessing maybe I'm walking into some, but I I get actually really frustrated by the farmers that reject the thank a farmer like motif. And the reason that I do is because people are living in the city and they want to be connected mm-hmm. with where their food comes from. And gratitude is is a good human emotion. It's mm-hmm. it's a it's a thing that makes you grounded into, you know, where do I come from? How is all this possible? And so when farmers are like, we've heard it too much and we don't want it, it's like, are you missing a chance to build a relationship with with people that that? Let, can, let, let, intro, let me right? save you, yeah. Meg, so that you can run for future office and still get an <laughs> ag vote. Here it is. Okay. Yes. It's not that we don't like the Thank a Farmer movement, but especially in the early days of social media, it was abused. And it was, well, you have to listen to us because we're farmers or whatever. Yes. Without farmers, uh, you'd be dead, right? Because you can't eat. Without electricity in the winter, we'd be dead. Without uh, soldiers. I mean, there's so many people that are critical to everything. So yeah, farmers are important, but we're not the end all be all. There were certain people out there that were acting like we were the end all be all. And I think that's where the pushback from a lot of farmers, especially in social media, came from, because we would have uh, people that maybe weren't even active farmers were speaking for us. And you couldn't counteract them because, hey, we're farmers, we're untouchable. So I think maybe that's where it comes from on the agriculture side. OK, I mean, I can see that point of like. We don't want to get into the position where there are some people that believe that they're above other people because they, they keep being thanked all the time. That's mm-hmm. probably a good good thing. Well, and that's good background because I, I came to social media, I think, after a oh, lot of that. So, so. You're so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I see it as like what you mentioned. If there's a thank a, a farmer campaign, that's a touch point of, hey, look, this is who's growing your food. Here's a connection point. And if you're you know, meeting a farmer and you're saying thank you, that's starting a conversation that has potential to go somewhere and, and be positive and, and impact people in the way that they understand agriculture and support it and, and buy their food. It never really dawned on me the challenge of the Canadian farmer being like, well, it's not that people don't want to thank a farmer, it's that they don't think about us, right? Like, I think the American farmer in many ways has had, has at least been marketed to that everybody loves them. I, yeah. There's definitely, I mean, if I were to have a criticism of the thank a farmer movement, it's that it ends up being a marketing campaign to the farmers right. to sell more seed as opposed to understanding where the balance is. But it is deeply important to me, the issue that you bring up, which is people were going to the grocery store saying, I don't want to buy that one because that one may poison my family. Yeah. That's a real problem. Mm-hmm. Where did that come from? In your, I, I have my own opinion, but where do you guys think that it came from? 
I think when we have unknowns, uh, we just fill in the blanks. And if we, you know, I didn't know anything about grain farming. So it was really easy to fill those blanks in by the little snapshots that I saw pop up, whether that was David Wolf or whoever, right? Oh, were you afraid? Were you a David Wolf fan? Would no, you? but that stuff would come across. I thought I thought GMOs were bad when I came to farming. I didn't like the fact that crops were sprayed. And then I came to the grain farm and realized why we're using these things, how we're using it, the timing of some of those products, how you know spraying to desiccate a crop, so to kill a crop, um, after the wheat kernels, say, are below a certain moisture percentage, then you're not actually affecting or putting that product into that kernel of grain. So it was it was learning all of that thing, those things that made me realize that's not something I needed to fear. So I think when we don't know things, it's easy just to take all of that clickbait stuff and jump to our own assumptions and then look at the side that's driving some of those conversations and how do they do that? They use fear. And we, we as humans, we use emotions to make decisions. Why though? Why do they use fear? Like th- this is the thing that one of the things that I would say people are afraid to say in agriculture is that there is so much money, billions and billions of dollars to be made by making you afraid of that other one so that the thing that you're selling is no longer a commodity, it's a specialty product. Mm-hmm. Oh, Vance. <laughs> there do you go. You, there. No, no. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yes, I think maybe I know where you're going, especially when you talk about, uh, yes, I'm going to bash conventional agriculture like you're talking about, even though it's completely safe. I'm going to bash it because it's going to benefit me. I'm selling a product that competes with it. It's easy to use fear. Fear, emotion, the, the, the pull in the heartstring, that's going to trump fact and science on the marketing side every time. And it's, it's tough because we in agriculture don't feel like we can go that way. We feel like, all right, we're always going to beat them with, with facts. We're always going to beat them with science. When you hear, who is it, Sarah McLaughlin, when she sings that song, in the, the arms of an angel, right? And you see the little puppy. Of course she's Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> when I watch that commercial, I'm so mad because I'm like, man, they are nailing it. They are they are getting people's emotions. They're going to get people to call in and donate money. It's not to save puppies. It's it's to lobby against uh, livestock farms. But they use that fear. They use that heart str- that the wait, tug on wait, the heart wait, string. Wait, 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 what? Okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. This commercial thing. Oh man, there's a rabbit trail. It just went. All right, so <laughs> HSUS, right? You may just okay. I do yes. know that yeah. they, they are supposedly not the good guys that everybody <laughs> thinks that they are. Okay, just in the oh man, just in the name, right? Because there's a humane society and humane society in the United States are two different, and, and the one isn't a lobbying organization that mainly goes against commercial agriculture, especially on the livestock side. But they use those commercials to get money, saying that they're going to give to shelters, and I mean just a, a smidgen goes to the shelter. The rest of it goes to lobbying. So us in agriculture, what are they lobbying for? They don't like uh, the CAFOs, the Concentrated Animal Livestock Facilities. Uh, the, they don't like uh, modern agriculture, especially on the livestock side. I think they want to do, to me, my my mind is they're anti-meat. Uh, they want to do away with it. But uh, what they want to do is they want to go towards um, having a meatless society. Mm-hmm. Would you, I don't know, would you agree with that? <laughs> yes, I would say we're seeing that a lot too in Canada in different ways. That push to be, I mean, I was on a, I did an interview the other day about the UN's recent report, how we need to change the way we produce our food because otherwise we're not going to have a positive impact on climate change. And it is, it's that we need to lose meat. And what's not part of the conversation is what we're already doing in agriculture, how in Canada, only 2.4 of our emissions are from cattle. And we're actually sequestering carbon, so storing carbon in the soil by maintaining and properly grazing those pastures. So it's, but you see the other side of it, right? You just see the puppy, the sad eyes, and for somebody that doesn't know the backstory, which why would you, unless you're talking to a farmer? Do you think people know that Vance left? I think they'll see it on the camera that he ran out of here. <laughs> and we're just leading this by ourselves now. I don't know. At what point do we start stealing this stuff? <laughs> oh, oh, he brought, oh, he brought beer. I brought more beer. <laughs> so it can't right. be that bad. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you missed, uh, missed some good stuff. So Meg was talking about the, the carbon sequ- sequestration. It's a duffer. 
I wish I could remember the name of the guy we had on the What the Farm podcast. Oh, he's a German doctor, and he had the numbers to the T. And I told myself, I'm going to remember these numbers and the percentages. But, I mean, the percentages of, of you know, the, how that cattle and livestock hurt the environment are, like, minuscule, microscopic compared to, you know, transportation, uh, cement production, stuff like this that we need, of course, but yet certain groups certain certain organizations have been able to portray livestock as the end all be all of climate change and how they're ruining the environment it's all a push not to eat meat it's all a push about people that want a vegan society Mm -hmm. you you can take that to the bank fans and uh what do you what do you think of that because i mean if you're not going to eat meat you're going to eat vegetables i mean it's still going to be a farmer yeah it's still at like I mean, I have my own opinion about this, but I, I one of the things that I think is an interesting outgrowth of this vegan movement is it's not like you're saying we don't like all farmers because we're vegans. It's just you don't like those ones that are raising livestock. The other farmers that are raising tomatoes and carrots and, mm-hmm. and those kind of things, they're all going to be just fine. Okay. The Impossible Burger, right? From Whopper? Yeah. That's all soy. Whatever. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Okay. E- we don't have a problem with that. And the proof of it is back in the 90s, McDonald's had the, what, the McLean or whatever. It was a plant-based burger, too. It never went over. The problem with the Impossible Burger is that they're saying, see, you can have this now instead of having meat. And if you do this instead of meat, you're going to be better for the environment. That's not true. Hey, you want to eat a soy burger? Go ahead. I'll grow soy. But don't sit there and bash the beef industry over it just to sell your soy burger. That's my opinion, but it's the right opinion. It's going to be interesting because this is going to play out. Here's the thing that I see in agriculture that's going to be very interesting here. You chose not to take, not you, like farmers. Oh, yes. I'm trying to be careful because. It's a great podcast, by the way, Vance. Right. We'll (laughs) we'll see. I mean, uh, farmers have been very careful not to say organic is bad. Right. They've, they've been able to say, hey, that's one way of growing it. And we grow this other conventional way mm-hmm. at its core. There's not a huge difference between somebody saying a vegan diet is good or no. An omnivore's diet where you can eat meat is is good. But those are conflicting things just the same way as conventional and organic. But yet in right now, farmers feel completely fine saying F you to the people that are driving the vegan agenda, but you weren't willing to say F you to the organic agenda. I, <laughs> as, as a meat eater, um, I am all for everybody having options. You want to be vegetarian? Go for it. You want to be vegan? Go for it. I, it doesn't affect me. I fully support that choice. You don't get to come over and tell me how to eat. Like I, I feel maybe that's where the difference is and that it's that was organic attacking conventional absolutely they were putting out those articles those those commercials that were going mainstream seen by millions of people that the conventional one the old mcdonald one right so that's organic valley you know puts out where these kids are singing old mcdonald and they're spraying pesticides all over the place and then when you came out with the organic farm that one didn't have the toxic pesticides okay i feel that didn't happen to the same extent in canada canada's got some really strict rules about whether you can okay. say that kind of stuff or not. So that would be maybe why it was a little bit different. But I actually sat down with a vegan when I was in Germany last November. And it was a vegan and three farmers. And we sat down. We had an open, honest conversation. And it was very interesting to understand kind of the ideology behind their decision-making process where... You know, I want so my friend who who I was staying with and who was talking to the vegan with me, he is a pig farmer, a a pork farmer in Germany. And recently they had to put lights in their barns at night. So there's always light, um, a certain amount of light in in every stall. And I asked about that. I said, that's not natural. You wouldn't have that in nature. And where it stemmed from was basically people, uh, vegans pushing, saying, well, if I got up in the middle of the night to find food and water, I would need light. So then the pig should also have light. Whoa. And so it's it's putting human needs Anthropomorphization, and, yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's what's going on. I mean that that's scary thing. Yeah. Wait. I don't know. You and your big words. Well say it again. Anthropomorphization. 
even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious. <laughs> All right, so we interviewed a vegetarian. You should do more podcasts after having had a couple drinks. This is great. This is, I'm not sure this is a beer. It's a Bud Light Lemon Tea. It's unusual. And you're drinking White Claw. What? Okay, now what do we got? Oh, now I don't have it. I got superfluous and not oh. enough coasters. Okay, we'll try this one. You got big roots now. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All See of a sudden, it rubs all off. Of a sudden, right. Okay, so we're interviewing, Leslie and I were interviewing a vegetarian. And she told the story of why she became a vegetarian is because she had a friend that worked at a meatpacking plant for a while. And she described he described it to her in a way that made her physically ill when she ate meat. She didn't eat meat because of a belief. You can't change that. And if you're a farmer and you say, well, I'm going to change her opinion by giving her a, a good steak. I mean, you're a jackass. It's her belief. You can't change that. The problem is when she goes out there and says, everybody has to stop eating meat because of my belief, or we need to change the rules like having lights or whatever because of my belief. Everybody's different. Everybody's going to make the world go around. Vegans are a very, very small percent of the population. They're just some of them are very, very vocal. So in my opinion, farmers spend way too much time concerned about vegans. Yeah, I'm I'm conflicted on this and I don't have a great perspective, but there is this thing. So there's a guy named uh, Nassim Taleb who uh, he wrote a book that you might have heard of called The Black Swan, where it's it's basically like there are occasionally events that happen that are so catastrophic that, you know, you have to you have to accommodate everything in order to avoid that happening. And that's his case against GMOs, that it might be a black swan event. What? Nick, How is that? So, well, I I wouldn't go into it. This is just the precursor to say Nassim Taleb is very anti-GMO, like has extreme feelings about it. Um, our friend Kevin Fulta has been a target of him. Like Nassim Taleb uh-huh. is well known. One of the things that he says that is spot on, though, that of all the things I disagree with is a concept called the intransigent minority. The intransigent minority is... If uh, we all went to a picnic, right, and let's say there were, you know, 10 people there, one of them says, if that orange juice is labeled not kosher, I will not drink it. I can't have anything here that I won't eat that. I won't eat that. It's, if, if I don't have that, you know, F you. Mm-hmm. Right. So that person now everybody could try and say either go away that person or if you want to have them around and you find that there are some things that you could get in the store that have that little kosher label, mm-hmm. you'll do it. Right. And that is the same thing that happens with GMOs, because you could say, well, you know, I don't care whether I'm not going to be pro GMO. I'm, I'm just going to be if there if it's easier for me to buy brownie mix that says it's non GMO. So that yeah. the kid at the PTA conference or the, the child of the PTA person doesn't fight against it. So herein lies the challenge of allowing the the small group of people that are extremely angry like you said yourself the Mm -hmm. vegans are a really small percentage of the population and yet we know all about them right farmers definitely know all about them because (laughs) not all of them are are in your face either like not not all vegans are going to be in your face saying yeah you're doing horrible things you're right so there's a percentage that they're happy to make that decision for themselves and not try to overtly put it on to everybody else but you have to you i can understand why farmers would be so sensitive to the vegans because of that concept of the intransigent minority mm-hmm. because a small group of people that will say well look just i mean because like and i didn't notice this until nasim talib um, pointed out do you know what the kosher symbol is no find out what it is in canada turn your orange juice around your milk your there there is a kosher label on so many of your foods hmm. you would not believe it and it's because if to put it on here is not that expensive but it gives you back two percent of the population that will buy your things whereas if you right. don't there's no chance that they will buy your things and mm-hmm. that's that's what non-gmo is yeah i'd say in canada what's more driving the the anti-meat would be the whole climate change conversation is that a big deal in canada massive so tell me about what 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 do you mean? People are like really worried that the polar ice caps. Are, are you worried about the polar ice caps melting? Is that something? That keeps well, I would you say up global night? warming. I would say climate change. Oh. Right. <laughs> so that was like partially uh, the prime minister. Like we have a federal Wait, election coming in. There's a difference in. between global warming and climate change. 
I'm not making a joke. I'm saying I've never heard that before. I thought they were synonymous terms. Okay, so the the term has been changed from global or from uh, global warming to climate change because really. This is really this is news to the, uh, hey, we know something Vance does. <laughs> wow, this is not happening on my YouTube right channel. So yeah, this is yeah because that was the thing, right? Well, it's not getting warmer here. The ice caps aren't melting, so it it changed in a way to have a better conversation about it. That it's climate change. It's not global warming. It's not this. It's that the climate is changing at a rate that is that we are, and the climate's always changing, right? Whether we're on this earth as, as humans or not, the climate is going to continue to change and evolve. That's right. To say that we're the only ones influence, influencing it is absolutely crazy. Are we speeding up the process? Possibly. The perfect example is if you drive in in uh, west in St. Louis. So as you've come out closer from here, from the arch, there are rock outcroppings, right? And those rock outcroppings are limestone. Limestone comes from these little tiny shellfish trilobites and all these things that fell at the bottom of the ocean and they were pressed on top of each other so much that you have giant mm-hmm. rock formations that you can stand on top of and if you fell off of them you would certainly die that's how far they mm-hmm. are up in the sky it's because it used to be ocean here yeah. that's how much mm-hmm. the climate can change so we actually had a, a federally forced carbon tax come into a, a saskatchewan so into our province this april because what we had as a provincial plan or as a, what you guys would have as a state plan um, was not deemed enough for the climate change conversation for what Canada was trying to achieve. And so the federal government forced a carbon tax into our province. Why are people voting in favor of these types of taxes? Because climate, like literally in Canada, climate change will be one of the hottest topics going into our fall election this year. And it was the last time. That was part of the platform that got him elected, Justin Trudeau. So you would think Canada would want climate change, get it warmer. <laughs> well, you, are you able to grow different crops where you're at because of the? I mean, that that that's legit. There's no doubt. South Dakota. There are people in South Dakota right now growing corn, longer day corn than they grew in the past because of climate change. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I might, I might argue that All right. there, there's a lot to do with genetics, a lot to do with plant traits, breeding traits that have come into that, a lot to do with uh, improvements on irrigation or have been able to irrigate different areas that haven't been irrigated before. So, you're the only that, – that, that, that is not what I hear – I'm not saying that you're mm-hmm. you're wrong. I'm saying in the, in the circles that I have run in, the reason they say that you're able to grow corn in Canada right now is because climate change has made it so that the growing zone – do you have enough heat units that you can pull out 90 day corn? And so that's what people are doing. So last summer, uh, we went up to a farmer up there in Dodds Lane called Jeff Bennett's and he took us around on a little tour and yeah, you're growing soybeans up in your area. You're trying to, and you know, I would, I had to plant breeders right there from, I think they're from pioneer and I'm, you know, chewing their ear and everything. And we're like, well, in five years we'll have it here. And it was all because of the breeding and the plant that they were doing. Nothing to do with the change in the climate. So in that case, that's what it was. I would say that we're not seeing a consistent, you know, okay, well, we had three degrees warmer for this span of time, which is going to allow us to uh, grow different crops. What we're seeing is more extremes. So we yeah. went into this year being our third year of drought. So we had crops that we seeded at our normal planting time. So end of April um, that either germinated and then went dormant. So they stopped growing for four weeks or they didn't germinate at all until we had about five inches of rain come at the end of June. And that is not, you know, we have had cycles like that in the 80s. But in 2016, we had 38 inches of rain in that growing season so So, we're just we're just seeing more extremes happen more often that oh that hundred year old windstorm that only comes through once in a while you don't have to worry about anchoring those bins down they're never going to fly away we're seeing that every month or so or every you know couple times a year so so then you're saying climate change is real then what's your problem with the tax (laughs) <laughs> oh, this is a good one because I have been I've been lobbying against the carbon tax. Um, 
if and it's the way that it's being done so if and i do not believe that carbon tax is the only way to make changes if it was then don't turn around and give it back to the taxpayer which is what they're doing use it to do research use it to help industry become more sustainable so back it up what what do you mean they're they're giving it to the taxpayer that's what's happening yeah it's it's 90 percent of the tax that's collected is going back as a rebate to taxpayers and 10 percent is supposed to be for admin no 10 percent is supposed to go to industry to help them be more sustainable and I'm not sure who's doing math, but that doesn't leave anything to cover administration costs of the program. And Canada is a country that depends on global markets so for people, everything. So, so what you're saying is there are people that are incentivized now that if I really believe in climate change, I'm going to get a check that comes back to me from the bad people that are putting carbon out there. I get that check. Well, they also pay the carbon tax. So the carbon tax is on all uh, fossil fuels or at different forms, things that will create emissions. So natural gas, propane. So people then are paying it when they go to fill up their their car, when they go to heat their house. And so the thought process is with a carbon tax, then that's going to force me to think, well, maybe I don't need to use my car today. Maybe I'm going to bike to work. Or maybe I'm going to turn my thermostat down a little bit more during the winter, you know, try to save some, not burn as much natural gas. Um... And if you, I've lived in Vancouver, it's a very moderate climate. It's great. It's easy to make those changes. There's a lot of bike paths. There's a really great transportation system. If you're in the middle of nowhere farming, you don't have those same options, right? So it's colder. Um, We need vehicles to drive. The closest hospital's an hour away. We're bringing products from port a lot further. And in agriculture, uh, every other business that we deal with can pass that tax on can say, okay, well, carbon tax is costing me X amount. You know, we're trucking this uh, product in from wherever. So when I sell it, I'm going to increase the price I'm selling it to cover that cost. You can't do that in agriculture. We're price takers, not price setters. So it has a massive negative influence. And if you look on the other side of what we're doing in grain farming specifically, and even in cattle production, we're pushing for sustainable to be more sustainable all the time on our own and you know i'm a no-till farmer the only time that i'm turning that soil is when i seed into it and so i'm sequestering more carbon we're basically carbon neutral with our practices right now so when you say no-till so a lot of people that wouldn't have anything to do with farming wouldn't understand that one of the primary ways to get rid of weeds particularly when you go to plant is to drive a giant steel spike into the ground and drag it across so that you rip open the the soil and tear apart the roots of weeds and and make it rod readers so violent (laughs) yeah but but then the downside is one of the things that people don't realize when you're doing that tilling is any of that carbon that was sequestered right in that first five six inches you're you're cracking open the earth and literally throwing it up into the Mm -hmm. air it's an interesting thing which is why it's so funny that uh people that are so that want to fight climate change, they believe so passionately, are not the biggest fans of glyphosate ever. Yeah, I know. Right? Because well, glyphosate makes it so you don't have to exactly run that spike into the ground and, and yeah. make that happen. Well, and look at what we've done. So we have, on our farming equipment, we have emission controls on engines. We have uh, auto steers. So we have GPS that will run our equipment in the field, up and down the field. So we're only turning it. So that allows us to be very precise with what we're what ground we're covering. We have sectional control so that if our uh, equipment passes over an area where we've already sprayed, we've already seeded, that section will shut off. We've done all of these things without government saying, you need to be more sustainable. We've done that because we need to. That is the soil and the environment, that having a stable environment, that's our, that's our biggest asset. We need that, right? Were you in the world before there was no-till farming? What the hell kind of question is that? Do you think I'm that old? I mean, there was a time before they were using glyphosate. There was certainly you, you were certainly farming uh, with your dad, or somebody God, was farming you know, before Vance, they had. All right, I know, I know what you're saying. When I was a kid, we were still plowing. So that literally lifts you go down eight inches, you lift up the soil, you turn it over. So I mean, it is the most aggressive tillage you could do. Um, it's still done in throughout the country, throughout Canada, but it's it's pretty limited, wouldn't you say, as far yeah. as how much well, it's I, actually done? Sorry, just quick point. 
when we talk about sustainability, one of the things that we need to remember is that what is sustainable on my farm for my soil type, my climate, is not necessarily what will allow somebody else to be the most sustainable farmer. So, you know, there's tillage that's used to help dry out the soil so that it's dry enough that you can go in and plant when you need to, right? And so to say what's sustainable on Meg's farm should be applied as the most sustainable thing on Rob's farm, that doesn't work either. I mean, I think that the the fact that sustainable that word is the thing that we fight over or that farmers end up fighting over the scraps over is, is kind of my perception is because he who controls the definition controls the argument. So whoever decides what does the word sustainable mean gets to decide whether or not you're meeting that. And it appears to me that farmers every single year are saying, I'm, I'm using less fuel, I'm using less chemicals, I'm doing all of these things to ratchet down, and yet there's another person over here that just determines out of, out of a blank white sheet of paper <laughs> what is sustainable. And it's, it seems to me to be a losing position for farmers to be arguing, are we sustainable? Because you'll never be, it'd be like, am I beautiful? Right? Like, <laughs> am I beautiful enough? Am I more beautiful than that other person? But like, look at where it's coming from. It's what I see anyways in Canada is that it's consumer driven. So consumers are pushing. So? Do you think consumers really care about whether or not carbon is in their Cheerios? They care about sustainability and Health Canada is actually working on creating front of pack labeling for food like you would have your nutritional label that is a sustainability label. So consumers will buy products at stores based off of how sustainable that product has been created and force companies to work with like Quaker Oats has basically a report card. So they work with farmers who they rank high on a set of priorities. I don't know what that is. I've just heard about the program. So it's basically that you're going to, and the slide that I, I was in a meeting was showing to describe how they see this happening was that, uh, the carbon footprint of creating or growing wheat in Saskatchewan was then compared to the carbon footprint of growing wheat in Manitoba, where there is more tillage that's happening. And if you're a consumer that doesn't understand why that tillage is going on and that you can't compare an apple with an orange, then you're going to say, well, I'm not buying anything that's been made with wheat from Manitoba. It's not sustainable. Well, that's not true. It's just a different climate, a different environment. But it's it's coming from the consumer and companies are picking up on it and they're starting to push it on us. I <laughs> think that a huge proportion of the sustainability movement is driven by PR firms. And I think that it's driven by them to be like, Hey, let us give you a new way to be advantaged in the marketplace and people are really going to care about this because I cannot imagine very a very large percentage of people when they go to buy oats for oatmeal care whether or not there was they they, they care if they think glyphosate was used and that mm. may cause them cancer that they care about, right? But mm. do they care about whether or not it's going to make the earth That's why they're choosing to eat less meat. Like in Canada it's a thing. I, I, no, I, I think a lot of the times we get caught up on the, the people that are concerned about this. If you poll people, and we've done it a lot, we've done it through farm bureaus, we've done it on social media, we've done it on podcasts, that thing. Uh, it comes down to taste and price, and most of the time when people make the decisions in the grocery stores, is taste and price. The people that have the, the surplus and the income, that's where it comes into it. And that's where like the advertising agency and the PR firms, they're really pushing towards those people. Again, it goes back to what's the word you use about the the small amount of people making it? And the intransigent minority. <laughs> to hell. <laughs> it comes down to that. So they are they are after those people. And yeah, they have they have a lot more income to deal with than like say, you know, the the single mom that's raising a couple kids. Her, she's not gonna care as much. Uh, it's going to come down to what, what it's going to take to feed her family and still have enough money to pay the rent. Yes. But those those people that do have the extra revenue to make those decisions, they're the ones that are also driving policy. I agree with that. So, I, with I that. mean, look at GMOs being banned in Africa. You have affluential people that can afford to buy food. They're not worried about having a drought-resistant GMO corn because they're not worried about feeding their family. There, there's a talk that uh, an economist named Jason Lusk, who is at Purdue University, gave when he was he received the uh, CAST award, which is at the World Food Prize, they give a communicators award. And he deserved every bit of that award because he gave a talk that blew my mind. <laughs> and the talk essentially came down to 
if you were to give people a hundred dollars and say you can put this hundred dollars on whatever you want is it that to have cheaper food is it to have like does the price of food matter does the quality color branding f- livestock um animal safety animal welfare whatever and you watch until you get to sixty five thousand dollars a year the only thing you care about is price and quality mm-hmm. And then once you get over $65,000 a year, not only do you not care about price, you care about quality, but not you care about you all of a sudden start caring about the environment and start like whether the animals are treated well. And that's just a phenomena that is, I mean, really, really big. Mm -hmm. And you're right. Policy is driven by those people. Rob, let's talk about China. You raised hogs for a long time. Mm, yes, my family did. I personally raised hogs for like six months and about went bankrupt. But anyway. Well, you're familiar with how it all works. Yes. And they have just had what some people are saying, 20% of their, their herd cold, some people saying 50. So as, a, as an outlay, a huge percentage of what the Chinese diet is, particularly mm-hmm. of the middle class and above, is pork. Yeah. Why are they having to kill their 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 pig herds, and what is going on there? And and what, yeah, I'm no expert on the swine flu, the African swine flu. I'm no expert on it, but it you know it is as dangerous of a disease in pork as we've ever had, and we've always had one. I remember when I was a kid, it was pseudo rabies, and then it was the mystery disease, the mystery disease, and it was uh, pers, and you know it's all it's always something that's coming along, circle virus. I yeah, there's a bunch of reasons that we lost money. Uh, the African swine flu is a nasty one. And when you get it in a herd, the herd has to go. I mean, you just have to get rid of it. What happens to the pigs when they get it? Man, um, you would like to think that they are euthanized. Uh, in the United States, what would happen is they would be euthanized in the most humane way. And they would be buried or burned or whatever. I guess what I mean is, in uh, like... If somebody were asking me about African swine flu and some, what does it do to the pig? Do they cough? Do they do they get runny nose? Like what happens? Uh, you know, it even depends on at what age they get it. You know, there's age where they can get it and uh, they're still able to make it to you know slaughter where they can get it to meat. But if it gets in the herd, I mean, it's a disease that can kill the pig. If it gets in the herd, it, the herd has to go. There's no way that you're going to treat it, but it ju- you just have to eliminate it. It's like the worst disease. It's like foot mouth disease, really, that, that was here in the States in, what, 40 or 50s. You just got to get rid of it because if that thing could spread and take over the entire country. And so what are you hearing about what's going on in China then? You hear a lot of stories. I mean, I've heard over 50% of the herd. Uh, you know, China is China. For years, China has uh, been less than honest with the rest of the world in their in their trade and what's going on in there. So it's hard to tell what percent of the herd is actually, you know, I think according to their numbers, it's fairly low, 10, 20%. You talk to people that have been over there and come back, you said, no, it's, you know, it's half, it's more than that. So uh, it's hard to tell with China on anything. What does that do to the American farmer if 50% of their herd is cold? It depends on what kind of farmer. I mean, if I was a hog farmer right now, I'd feel pretty confident in the near future of what, you know, I'm making money in that. As a soybean farmer, I'm looking at a lot of my market being gone because it you it's not like you can just immediately replace them. There's a, a breeding cycle that goes through. There's a growth cycle that goes through. It's going to take a while to replace that. And what are the Canadians thinking? Do you guys talk about the uh, the pig crisis in China? It gets talked about, and I know that pork has come up on, um, like, some of our trade issues with China, which is weird considering what is going on there, but I don't know enough about our own pork market to know what amount we would send to China in the past. Um, yeah, but as as far as feed, that could be part of our canola issue, to oh, be quite really? honest, yeah. Do you feed canola to pigs? The meal. So a lot of, when I say they're buying our canola, it's not just the canola seeds they would be buying. Um, it's also oil. But what's used as feed is the canola meal. So once you crush the canola, extract the oil, you've got the hull left. That's used as feed. So that's a big part of that 40% of our canola market is China. 
uh, I, I couldn't tell you the stats on how much of that is meal, but a fair amount of that is canola meal that's been crushed in Canada and the, the meal is going to China for feed. So speaking of Canada, do you guys have regular presidential elections in the same way that we do? <laughs> like I have no, I mean, I know there's prime this minister. guy Trudeau. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have a prime minister yeah. and, and it's Trudeau, but like, I don't know how he gets into power. I don't know if he has the same power as our president. Should I just think of it as one to one Trudeau equals you know, Do you know him? Trump Jr. Trudeau. I don't personally know him, but I know he does not like me. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was supposed to speak on a panel at a tech conference in Toronto. Um, what would in be May. something you could say on this podcast that would catch his attention and he would not like? Oh, it wouldn't be on this podcast. That's all happened like with small business tax changes and stuff. But um, we have an election every four years. No, I'm asking you to say yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> No, he uh, he hears it all the time from everybody. Um, he's done. OK, what I can say is he's done more damage in Western Canada uh, as far as oil and gas industries go. Agriculture goes. The whole want to separate um, goes than his dad did in two terms. So he's done more damage in four years than his dad did in eight. And the. How Western Canadians, so Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, how they feel um, that they stand in the country, they have the lowest opinion of feeling connected with the rest of Canada that has been around since the 50s. And there's massive talk of uh, separation right now. Wait, and what does that mean? Separation how? That Western Canada would become its own country. Like that is a conversation that is happening and if he gets in Wait, again, is that legit? Like, like seriously, literally, we could see two countries out there. I don't think we will actually see it, and I hope that we won't. And it makes me really angry that there are so many people that that is how frustrated they are. That we feel like we have been completely, not even completely ignored. We feel that a lot of the moves that have been made by his government, his party, have been to alienate the West, have been to penalize the oil and gas industries, have been to penalize agriculture, um, and the way that our our system works is. It's based off, like, seats are based off of population. And the majority of Canadian population is Ontario and Quebec. So when we vote in Western Canada, we don't have a massive influence on who gets into power. So you don't have an electoral college, like a republic, in the same way that the United States does? That's interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, I mean, they actually used to, I think it was in the 80s, they stopped doing it because people stopped voting. They would announce who won the election before people in Alberta had even voted because of the time change. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it is just all around the country. It's just a straight up and down popular vote. Yeah, it's you, you go mark your ballot. You've got the different parties. Each party has a leader. And the who leads that party is done by an election Um, within the party so the party votes but also people who are card carrying members of that party would vote for who that leader would be what is the canadian impression of the electoral college in the united states i think it could i I wouldn't want to replicate the system exactly i don't think that would fit but i would like to see something more like that in canada so that there's more equal voices for all of uh, across the country instead of just based off of population because what we have isn't working. Um, you have provinces that feel alienated, but on top of that, it doesn't matter who gets elected. They can say they don't want to you know, ignore Alberta, ignore Saskatchewan, but when it comes time in four years or three years to get reelected, who are you going to cater to? You're going to cater to the places where you, you get have, your votes. Exactly. And Rob, are you hearing the same thing that I am on on YouTube that people are saying we should get rid of the electoral college? Are farmers concerned about that? Uh, uh yeah, of course. I mean that that would be a bad case for rural America, but I I don't know if really anybody's concerned about it. It's kind of like uh, the civil war up in Canada. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people talking about it, but I mean, would it actually come to that extent? I mean, that would, that's what the constitution was based off. Our forefathers knew that was important. They knew the importance of uh, having the, the rules areas of the country represented as long as, as well as the urban areas. So yeah, we know it. I would, if you're asking my opinion, whether farmers are worried about it, probably not. Yeah, it, I uh, I had a chance to go to the American Enterprise Institute. I was invited to like a week long or weekend long seminar thing. And uh, my big question, the thing I wanted to ask Charles Murray, one of their big scholars was, 
do you think they're going to abolish the electoral college? And I didn't even get the question fully out before he started laughing at me. And so I was like, all right, well, maybe it's a silly question. But you hear it talked about. You hear people saying the electoral college is, you know, not the right system and we should get rid of it. I know that you would have to make a constitutional amendment, but you yeah. definitely hear people in the city feeling like why, it's not fair that the people in the yeah. countryside get get more power in their votes than I have. I think George W. Bush actually ended up winning the popular vote against Al Gore, I think. Uh, and then you had Hillary that lost to Trump. So let's say the next... Uh, Democrat loses to Trump, but wins a popular election. Yeah, there's going to be a lot more screaming for it, especially from the urban areas, because just because our guy didn't get in, right? And they're going to figure that our guy's not going to continue to get in because of these these dumb hicks that keep getting their guy in because of the the electoral college. I could see that scenario. I would say in the United States, it's still pretty hard to change the constitution, though. Yeah, I would say it would probably be harder yeah. to change the constitution now than it has been. Yeah. You're, for, you're originally an Illinois guy, right? Yeah, that's right. So in Illinois, we hear it all the time, right? We're going to like slice off Chicago. We're going to slice off those three counties up there, and we're, you know the rest of the state's going to live in harmony, and we're going to let them do their thing up there. It's so, never going to happen. So bringing up Illinois, uh, you are less than six months away from having recreational pot mm-hmm. legalized. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen to your the culture of, of the people you're around? Is it going to change things? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't foresee hardly any change at all. I mean, there's probably going to be additional tax revenue come in because of how it's set up. Uh, Illinois, we're used to corruption. I'm sure the whole pot situation is going to be corrupt as hell. But no, I don't see. I mean, we've seen it in what Seattle. We've seen it in Colorado. It's not. I don't know. It's not not the end all be all. How about Canada? You guys have legalized. Uh, yeah, working. in October, the whole country uh, legalized. Which I think, if you're going to do it, you might as well do the whole country because otherwise, you're not crossing state lines. You're not, you know, interprovincial. Um, I don't think there was a massive change. There was a big kickback from the rule against it. I grew up in a big city. For me, maybe it makes it. I see it making possibly a safer environment for the teens that are going to try it at that age to get it which if they want to try it and i grew up with a lot of you know people in high school that did so i had a guy on that um the most comments i've ever gotten on a youtube video or or anything was a guy that i had on my podcast that built up a company and sold it it was a cannabis company for 22 million dollars right it's probably the wealthiest 30 something year old I've ever met. He had business partners, but did very well for himself. And he said, I didn't smoke pot. Actually, I don't drink alcohol and I've never smoked pot. And he said this. People were so angry with him on YouTube that I, I like I didn't know if I should cut off the comments or not because people were like, he's a liar. And you're like, why is this such a big deal as to whether or not somebody has or hasn't? And if they say yes or no. So that's what it takes, right? To say, I'll I'll just say it right now. I I don't drink either. Yeah, that's right. Well, anyway, guys, this has been fantastic. I am so deeply grateful that uh, two people that have risen to prominence in the ag sphere were willing to sit down and chat while we were drinking beers. <laughs> Megs, I uh, wish you all the best in your uh, Canadian political uh, aspirations. <laughs> I might have ruined them tonight. We'll see. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This is fun. And Rob, thanks for stopping by and uh, and being on the podcast. Oh, no. Thank thank you, Vance. And uh, so what is the name of the podcast? Uh, this is just the Vance Crow podcast. I know you guys are pushing for As the Crow Flies. As the Crow Flies. Don't you think that'd be <laughs> that a better one? Be good. It has a ring to it. I mean, you got the crow can, over there in the corner. You can take it anywhere, too. That's right. Yeah, topic. you spelled that wrong, though. With an, is that the European or the Canadian That spelling? is actually the way my name is spelled. So, I, I anyways, we will sign off for now. Thank you so much for How, listening. Well, we want to talk some more. Well, we can always re- hit the record button again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to do it for the podcast this week. Thank you so much. 
to Meg Reynolds and Rob Sharkey for stopping by. If you want, I highly recommend that you follow them on Twitter. They are both very compelling people. They've built up quite an audience. And what you can see if you follow them is conversations that farmers are having all over the world about various issues in the farming world, about trade, about politics. And it is an inside view that agriculture would be excited to see you there if you're not a part of the ag world. They're always looking for new people to talk with and answer questions. And so if you do follow them, just make sure you tell Rob and Megs that you heard their interview on the Vance Crow podcast. Next Wednesday, I will be interviewing a man named Jason Bachman, founder and owner of an iconic St. Louis company called Strange Donuts. Now, you could listen to this and say, well, what do I want to listen to the owner of a donut shop? And yeah, they're strange, but what could he say that's so interesting? I would venture to say that this is one of the most compelling and spellbinding interviews I've ever seen. Not that I've ever conducted. I mean, literally, that I have ever seen. From the very beginning, Jason opens up and he just starts talking about his successes and his failures and how he got to where he is. At the very beginning of the podcast, we're talking about how did he learn the lessons to become the boss that he is today. And it takes a little while, but he ends up explaining that when he was 14 years old, he had a pretty rough childhood. And he was exposed to a world that most of us will never see any any closer than on the movies. And when he was 14 years old, he was an enforcer at a crack house. Meaning, he was the guy that when the crack fiend couldn't pay, he would throw them out of the house. And he moved from being that to being an award-winning business owner that runs multi-million dollar contracts all over the world. He is beloved by everyone that he interacts with and runs one of the most famous companies in St. Louis. I was deeply honored to have met Jason and will now vow to try and do everything I can to be friends with this guy because his philosophy on life is absolutely amazing. So I hope you will tune in on Wednesday to listen to that interview because it's going to blow your mind the way that it blew mine. So thank you so much for stopping by and we'll see you on Wednesday.